Welcome again in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the good news of Matthew. And we are in chapter 25, and it is a sequence that we have entered into, and it's a sequence concerning the Lord's teachings with respect to his second coming. In uh, chapter 24, he has told us the various episodes that must come before he comes. But now in chapter 25, we are told that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins, (coughs) which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And Luke tells us the bridegroom comes after the uh, marriage marriage supper of the Lamb and everybody is waiting for him. And uh, here are these ten virgins. Five of them were wise, five were foolish, and the foolish took not their lamps, took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wives took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And uh, while the bridegroom tarried, because again, one of the features of the wedding feast, is you don't know when the bridegroom is coming. And so uh, they all slumbered, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Well, all these virgins arose. And the foolish said to the wise, Give unto us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And the wise answered, Not so. Lest there be none enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And they went to buy. The bridegroom came. And they that were ready to be with him to the marriage and the door was shut and afterward came the other virgin saying Lord, Lord open to us and he said well verily I don't know you see now this is one of the truths that we must understand the thought of being ready when he comes ready when he comes ready when he comes And uh, it's something we've tried to stress, you know, throughout these lectures, that how you finish life's race is the all-important. How are you going to finish life's race? Well, are you going to finish it, you know, just crawling in? No. We want to realize that in a race, in a normal race in the Olympics, The greatest spurt is withheld for the last moment of the race. And so, in a real sense, that we as Christians must conserve our greatest effort for the end of our life. Well, he then goes on to say, uh, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour when in the Son of Man cometh. In other words, be ready. <clears throat> be ready. You know, readiness for the Lord's coming is essential. And it is to be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit at all times. Be ready. Be ready. You know, be f- full of vibrancy. For the Lord's coming. And then uh, (coughs) we have what is called the parable. A very important parable of the talents. There are two parables essentially that run along these same lines. One is a parable of the pounds found in Luke chapter 19. When they're going up to Jerusalem. And the other is the parable of the talents now I'd like to compare these two uh, parables with you because they're very important indeed you know they're going up to Jerusalem in Luke 19 
And the Lord is giving this parable. And essentially what he's saying, you know, the Lord of the house is giving to each of his servants one pound. And he said, occupy till I come. When he comes back, one said, well, I've made ten pounds. And another said, I've made five, another two. And the one that only had one had buried him, buried it. See, now, in one sense, everybody had equal opportunity. Equal opportunity. And in a certain sense, we all have equal opportunity to serve the Lord. You know, we all have 24 hours in a day. What are we doing with those 24 hours? Are we serving the Lord or not? Are we utilizing our time or are we wasting our time? Are we living in pleasure Or are we living soberly? Because, you see, at the end of the life, it will be shown us what we did with life. And all the sadness that so many will have, realizing that they were given an opportunity with the others, but they did not utilize that time that was given, the opportunities that were given to serve the Lord. And therefore they come in perhaps the kingdom of heaven almost bankrupt. Now, this parable of the talents is different. And I'd like to look with you very carefully at verse 15. It's a good man. And uh, he gave five talents to another, to another to two, and to another one one then it adds this to every man according to his several ability according to his several ability now here's the difference between the pounds and the talents everybody had equal opportunity with the pounds but the talents is different the talents are given concerning one's ability you know in life we are judged essentially on three areas one our character second our abilities and third our productivity what are we doing you know with those things that we have been given well all three character ability and productivity in a sense, flow together. Because dependent upon your character is what you can develop your abilities and become productive. Now, are you a wise person? See, are you a wise person? And, uh, you know, the one who is given five talents, can I say this? that it's evident that the man knew his servants. He knew his servants. And the Lord knows us. And the Lord knows what we will do with what we're given. And the abilities that he gives to us, he knows whether we shall utilize them or whether we shall just put them in a cupboard, you know, and not bring them out. And what is it with us? You know, let us look back and see what God has given to us. Because in a very real sense, what John the Baptist said is true. You know, what have we that we have not received? And we have received the ability to do certain things. Perhaps some have received ability to study. Others to preach others to help people, others to be a good administrator. You know, we've all received talents, and we ought to reflect on that. What talents has God given to us? And after meditating on that, we should then say, um, well, what are we doing with them? What are we doing with them? If we have the ability to teach, are we teaching? 
are we teaching? Or are we wasting our time here on earth? Well, it's interesting too that the one who was given five talents made five talents. The Lord knew what he was doing when he gave that person five talents. He knew that he would utilize that which he was given. And uh, the one with two talents, he knew what he was doing there. Yes, he knew that that person would, you know, be productive to the extent of two talents. And, uh, you know, the Lord is a wise businessman. And when you consider it, you know, a businessman invests accordingly in that which is going to bring him profit. He puts most into the area where there's profit coming. And then when there's not so much profit, he won't put so much in. And so you see, there are people who say to me, Oh, I wish... I had that talent. And I say to them, well, what talents have you got? And they might say this and that. And I say, what are you doing with them? Well, they said, "Uh, well, nothing actually. But we would like that talent. I said, you're not going to get another talent if you don't use what God has already given you. And this is something that we have to understand because... At the end, in verse 29, the Lord is going to make a statement. He said, For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. For from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. In other words, you know, we have a saying in this life, money makes money. And to a certain extent that is true. And someone who has something makes it somebody who writes, writes somebody who preaches, preaches someone who uh, composes uh, shall I say choruses you find them in a, bringing out chorus after chorus they're very fruitful see and so this is that which we have to look at now then of course there's a day of reckoning And uh, the one that has five talents, he comes and behold, he said, I've gained beside thee five talents. And uh, the answer is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I'm reading from verse 21. Uh, Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And then, the one who has two, you know, produces two, and he said, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But the one that buried his talent, he said, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest I reap where I sowed not, gather where I have not strowed. I mean, the Lord didn't argue with him. He said, yes, I am a hard man. I expect to get from the things that I have entrusted to you. And he called him a wicked and slothful servant. And uh, slothfulness is a terrible sin. Because a slothful person accomplishes virtually nothing. Well, there we are. Now, we continue in this uh, chapter. And uh, now, instead of uh, looking at individuals, the Lord is looking at nations looking at nations and uh, on occasions you know I've been to various nations 
And uh, God has spoken to me about, shall I say, the way he looks at those nations. But anyway, let's get to the uh, point here, first of all, and then we'll come back to that. And uh, he said, when he comes in his glory, it won't just be individuals that are judged, no. But it will be nations And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left. And then the king shall say to those on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And that's full of truth too. You know, These things that we read in the Word of God, you know, Christ slain, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. You know, God knew everything that would take place and uh, ordained it, and nothing catches him by surprise. And so he's prepared a kingdom for the righteous nations. Well now, let us continue here. And he said, I was hungered, he gave me meat. I was thirsty, he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, you clothed me, I was sick, you visited me, I was in prison, you came unto me. And uh, a righteous said, uh, well, when did we see you sick? When we, did we see you in prison? And so forth. And the Lord answered, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now, many of us live in nations where if you see someone in need, you know, on the highway you will stop, say, can I help you? But there are other nations, and I'm not going to mention them, because that wouldn't be right, because these tapes go everywhere. But uh, I was in a certain nation, and I was being driven by missionaries of that nation. And uh, by the side, we saw a man who had obviously been struck by a car laying in the roadside and there were people around and I assumed oh well they're going to look after him I think it was about 10 o'clock in the morning well about 6 o'clock in the morning uh, in the evening sorry we came by again and lo and behold that person was still lying there and I said to the missionaries how do you explain that? Hasn't anybody taken care of him? Well, they said, the law of the country is this. That if anybody touches that person to help them, they are completely responsible to take care of that person until he gets well again. And uh, they said, therefore, nobody would take care of him. And they were just leave him there until some of his relatives here, they'll come. And uh, I've seen that in other countries too. Somebody, you know, gets hurt, but nobody will come to their assistance. Well, as that's not true in America, everybody piles up their cars, you know, to help someone. And so it is in many other countries. So, uh, there is the point, you see. And uh, then those on the left hand, you know, uh, the Lord said, Depart from me, you cursed unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hunger, you gave me no meal, meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, he took me not in naked, and he clothed me not sick, and in prison he visited me not. 
And uh, they said, well, when did we see you in that condition? And he said, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Well, basically, we can divide the nations into two sections. Those who care for their wounded and those that don't. Those that care for those in need and those that don't. And there are the nations of this world who go over their own boundaries to help those in need. You know, there are all kinds of institutions like the very good one of doctors without boundaries. You know, they go over the boundary of another country for the sole purpose of healing the sick and helping those in need. And the amazing thing is this, that in some countries they are resisted for their goodness. Some countries do not want their people helped. And uh, I remember a certain situation, again, I'm not going to mention names of countries, but uh, where the head of the country knew that his people were starving, and uh, I think it was America and one or two other nations wanted to fly in goods, wanted to fly in food, so that they would be nourished. Do you know the head of that country refused? And so hundreds of thousands of his people died. Why? Because he refused help that others wanted to give. Well, <clears throat> the end of that person was he got his brains battered out with... Uh, shall I say, uh, sledgehammers. And somebody else came to the uh, status of president of that country. But I, I won't go into details more than that. But can you see the terrible thing that can happen? You know, instead of reaching out to help, what is the result one turns one back and does not help that person. You know, I, I've been in situations with my wife and myself running out of petrol by the roadside and standing there just gesturating with one thumb at uh, people that pass by. Inevitably, people stop. Can I help you? Yes, could you take me? the nearest gas station please where I can get some gas and they do that then so often they offer to bring me back again so kind of them well you see that is the attitude that we've got to have and you see the countries that go over their own boundaries to help others <coughs> those countries are blessed of God those countries are the righteous countries. Those countries that deal with corruption in high places, they are the righteous countries. They are the countries that will be on the right hand of God. And, uh, you know, nations, you know, exist for eternity. <clears throat> and uh, that can be easily proved from uh, the book of Revelation where it speaks of the righteous nations walking in the light of God the glory and her light and uh, I think that is so wonderful indeed that uh, <coughs> in uh, <coughs> eternity there will be those nations that have proven themselves here on earth and they will walk in the light of God in eternity in a new heaven and a new earth 
Now we want to pray that our nations or the nations that we live in, they should be counted righteous. And we want to ensure that the laws of the country in which we live in conform to the laws of God. And in so doing, you see, we shall see that when judgment comes, our nation through our prayers and through our efforts will be amongst the righteous nations and they will be on the right hand of God. And so that essentially, you see, is what uh, the Lord is saying here. And so often we think, oh, what does it matter? Politics, what does it matter? Well, it does matter because it will be determined according to the laws of our country and according to the way we look at those in need. It will determine whether we are on the right hand of God or the left hand of God. And uh, those should go away unto everlasting punishment, (coughs) but the righteous to life eternal. And we want to be (coughs) a member of a nation that goes to eternal life and walks in the light of God in the new heaven and the new earth. May God grant it. It be the countries in which we live. Thank you and God bless you.